this is difficult tasks, but looking into my bowel cancer, my bowel cancer slides, which you saw, there is an enormous uh, limit or border between self-care and general practice care. And our impact on that is bigger than I think we want to think of in everyday life. And I think we should work with that. We made an ecological study where we looked into mortality on a one-year survival from cancer. And if you look here, gatekeeper systems tend to have a higher one-year mortality. List systems tend to have a higher. And if general practice is always first point of contact, there's a higher mortality. It's highly statistical significant. Conclusion? No, it's a false conclusion. I give no conclusion. Gatekeeper systems are dangerous. But this study, which should be repeated and which should be challenged and which should be refined, addresses an important question. Are there problems with one way of organizing a healthcare system as compared to another way of organizing the healthcare system with respect to accessibility? Looking back into Barbara Starfield's papers, I have no doubt that gatekeeping and the front, strong front line is a good system in the same way as penicillin is the best antibiotic in the world. But even knowing that penicillin is the best antibiotic in the world, I keep thinking of the risk of side effects from every time I prescribe penicillin, and I'm sure all of us do so. We know that even the best have side effects. And I ask, even the best system, a list-based gatekeeping system, does that system have the risk of side effects which we have not addressed in a sufficient, in a sufficient uh, way until now? My own theory is, is explanation number three, but I don't know if I'm right. But I think that gatekeeper systems in Europe have had a tendency to be the political alibi for dangerous and unacceptable weights. And I think that's the problem with the gatekeeper system in UK, with the gatekeeper system in Denmark. I think that's the main problem with gatekeeper systems. But I'm not able to falsify, to say that the two first red lines are false. It may also well be that gatekeeping can create an inborn error in the relation between patient and doctor. We have to address that from a quality point of view. We can't tell if doctors are too eager to be gatekeepers or to be keepers. Personally, I've never liked the word gatekeeper. I think that the correct word is a gate advisor. I should just know where I am with my time schedule, just a second. It's okay. This was what I wanted to say about one of the core issues that I sometimes think that we have a tendency to forget in general practice. We see numbers and numbers and numbers of patients, but patients are very dependent that we are able to diagnose the very few with the seldom but very critical diseases, whether it's cardiology diseases or whatever it is. And do we address that enough from a quality point of view? I don't know for sure, but we should remember to do it. To give another example, oncologists like to say that we shouldn't use GP at all in oncology because at an average GP, he only sees 10 patients with cancer every year, and why in heaven should we use him for that? I hear that again and again when I, ask, uh, when I talk to oncology specialists. But they fail in their thinking because they forget that patients come with symptoms and symptoms. And at least once a day, according to investigations we have made in our department, at least once a day, we begin to investigate a patient with the idea it might be cancer or it might be something else. 
serious. So you are extremely dependent on support from the super specialist to the frontline provider with regard to filtering the very few among the very many with different symptoms. Now into chronic care, and I've been very happy to look into the program of this conference and also been very happy to look into what's going on in my own country and in other countries with respect to chronic care. There is a lot of activities going on, so I won't address the chronic care very much, but I will stress again that patients' opportunity for long life and their opportunity for high quality life is dependent on the, pro the frontline provider's quality. And we should avoid the situation where we can divide our 2,200 providers in Denmark into two groups, saying if you are in the bad group, you live shorter, and if you are in the good group, you live longer. But I know that in UK and in Denmark, there are different investigations going on where they try to correlate the quality of the general practitioner to the life length and the quality of life for chronic care. And I think we have a huge task in really delivering high quality chronic care so that patients can be sure that if in the long future, I'll, in the far future, I will get a chronic disease, I have the same chance to survive with my GP as with my neighbor's GP. That's the challenge in chronic care and therefore we have to work with chronic care. We all know the chronic care model and there's a lot of projects going on in our group looking into what goes on in the general practitioner's consultation. And I will give a lot of flowers for all that activity. But at the same time, I'll warn us all because if we should succeed, have success with chronic care, we should address all the topics. This slide is a busy slide. You shouldn't read it. But it's a slide which I picked from one of our PhD students at my department she is doing an intervention study with active implementation of a COPD guideline, and I recently saw that she's about to produce excellent results. That's another issue. I'll not talk about that today. But when she decided, now I will really push the way forward for COPD patients, she decided that all the bullets in these slides should be addressed in a high-quality way, and she worked with all of them. And and only by addressing, in her case, six, six big uh, areas, only by addressing that she could work with it. And I think we should seek collaboration with administrative staff, we should seek collaboration with specialists, we should seek collaboration with municipalities if we will have top success in chronic care. Take care not only looking into the consultation in general practice. It is a question about collaboration. It's a question about working together in a system, in a healthcare system. Let me move on to the next one, the preventive work in general practice. It's different in the different countries we all come from, how much preventive work we have to do in some countries, gynecological work is outside uh, front, uh, general practice. Uh, taking care of children is outside general practice. And in some countries, it's inside. You can reflect on what you do in your country, but all of us have some sort of structured preventive work in our practice setting. And how is it with the structured preventive work in our practice setting? We have for years had some selective preventive tasks in this country. There's been a historic, very high consensus about what we should do in chronic care. I, somewhere over there, you can see. Um, we have preventive in immunizations with extremely high attendance rates. We have child and maternity examinations, extremely high and well-evaluated care from a patient point of view. But over the last 30, 40 years, we have also got more and more preventive prescriptions. Maybe we have a tendency to forget that at any time we give blood pressure, a blood pressure prescription to a benign hypertension, 
It's a purely preventive prescription. It's not a cure. It's not treatment. It's a preventive prescription. And we have agreed on giving preventive prescriptions. The chairman of the Danish Ethical Committee recently said, I don't like preventive medicine at all. And I asked him, does that mean that all people in uh, treatment for hypertension should stop? No, no, no. It's, and then he told about what he was thinking of. He was thinking of that we may have had a tendency to treat too many with a prescription for hypercholesterol, I mean, uh, hypercholesterol, you read it, uh, <laughs> or for osteoporosis. And there's a, a huge spread in the 3,500 DPs in Denmark with respect to whether it's a good clinical practice to give that preventive medicine or not. We disagree with each other in a way that people become personal enemies by their disagreement. We begin to discuss preventive checkups for all pe persons over 40 years. And there is even a larger disagreement in between the general practitioners. And at the same time, we have high public expectations to what the GP can deliver within the issue of structured preventive care. And how can we in future cope with public expect? public expectations for preventive tasks if we have 3,500 people who disagree. That's the challenge. And in my opinion, it's more a personal opinion than it's a scientific opinion coming now, this is, in my opinion, the biggest threat to a national comprehensive approach to general practice care in my country, that if we can't agree on delivering something in a high quality way, we may have problems. We have problems to find common ground, and I've heard the same in UK, I've heard the same in Norway, in Sweden, in many countries, we have problems in finding common grounds with uh, respect to task definition. What should we expect? What is quality from a primary care provider? And I don't have the answer, but the risk is that in our country we end up with 2,200 GP settings with different attitudes to prevention and with different health politics. Our trade union and our college are struggling to try to keep one politics. But it's a difficult task, it's a real difficult task. And in this country I hear more and more politicians at meetings, only a few days ago I heard it again, we have to go for another arrangement of our front line. We have to push GPs back to where they are specialists. They are very good in sitting in their consultation, taking care of people who come to them with a symptom. A political fraction is beginning to address that type of questions. Do we want that and can we avoid that? I'm sure we can avoid it if we want 